Hello, welcome back. This is part three of lectures nine and ten. Today we're going to talk a little bit about the esophagus, uh, and then we're going to talk mainly about the stomach and about control of the stomach in digestion. This material, once again, is from chapter 23 in Marib. So let's get started. First of all, the esophagus, as we mentioned in the previous lecture, is a muscular tube that connects the laryngopharynx with the stomach. And here you can see the esophagus outlined. And this tube basically carries out peristalsis to move the food from the pharynx down to the stomach, as you see on the bottom here. Now the esophagus itself, as you see in the uh, light micrograph on the left side, has a lumen that's largely collapsed when it's empty. In other words, when there's no food in it, the lumen is basically collapsed and it turns into a flat tube. However, when food passes through it, it's elastic enough to open up to allow the food to be conveyed down to the stomach. You'll also notice that in the submucosa, we have some of these large glands that basically as food passes through here, they're squeezed and the mucus secretions from these coats the surface of the esophagus and allows the food to slide down a little bit more easily. Now it takes normally about seven or eight seconds for solid food to pass from the oropharynx down to the stomach. Liquids, however, much faster, maybe two or three seconds or so. And here we see the connections of the esophagus with the diaphragm and the stomach. There's an opening in the diaphragm that allows the esophagus to go through, and that's shown right here. And this is known as an esophageal hiatus. This is where the term hiatal hernia comes from. When there's a weakness in the wall on either sides of this, that allows contents from the stomach to reflux back up into the esophagus and cause GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease. Now the lower esophageal sphincter that we see here is one that we mentioned before and as food moves down the esophagus the sphincter relaxes, opens up, allows the food into the stomach and then once the food is passed the sphincter closes again to prevent any gastroesophageal reflux. You'll also notice on the left the rapid transition in epithelium from the esophagus, which is shown here in this purple color, to the epithelium in the stomach, which is a simple columnar type epithelium, as opposed to the stratified squamous epithelium that's in the esophagus. Very, very rapid transition as the esophagus ends and the stomach begins. You'll also notice something we'll talk about in a little while. These are the gastric pits within the stomach wall. And basically what these pits will do is inside here are glands that will secrete onto the stomach surface and we'll talk about exactly what those secretions are in a little bit. I just wanted to show you what those uh, pits look like. Okay, let's begin talking about the stomach. We're going to spend most of the time in this lecture on the stomach. Let's begin by talking about the functions of the stomach. And as you can see on the lower right, the stomach functions include some important things. First of all, mixing of the contents. That is, once food makes it down to the stomach, this temporary storage pouch for food until it's digested enough is going to mix the food. And one of the ways that the stomach mixes the food is by virtue of the muscular walls that you see on the left here. And one of the things that the stomach has that some of the other portions of the alimentary canal don't is oblique fibers. In other words, there's an additional layer of smooth muscle around the stomach in addition to the circular that we see here and the longitudinal fibers that we see here, the stomach also has oblique fibers, and the combination of all these fibers allows the stomach to churn the material that's inside and thoroughly mix the food. It also functions a little bit in mechanical digestion because it helps to grind the food up and then combine it with some of the enzymes in the stomach. The stomach also serves as a reservoir. As I mentioned, this is more or less a temporary storage pouch. When it's empty, the stomach holds about 50 milliliters of fluid. When it's really full, the stomach can hold up to four liters of fluid. So quite a tremendous amount of fluid can be held in the stomach. And normally, though, the stomach can hold about one to one and a half liters of material. The stomach is also very important at secreting gastric juice. We're going to talk about exactly what that gastric juice is in a couple of minutes. It's very important also at digestion. And this actually includes both mechanical digestion as well as chemical digestion. Mechanical digestion, as we said, is a product of these different muscle fibers that we have around the stomach. Chemical digestion is gonna be a function of an enzyme called pepsin. There's also antibacterial action by virtue of the acidity in the stomach. The pH in the stomach is about 1.5, ranges up to a high of about pH 3, and this is usually very harmful to most microorganisms. There are a few microorganisms that can survive in the acidity of the stomach, but for most microorganisms, the acid environment of the stomach is fatal. One of the other important things that the stomach does is that it facilitates absorption of vitamin B12. 
Now the vitamin B12 is not absorbed through the stomach, but what facilitates the absorption of vitamin B12 later on in the small intestine is something called intrinsic factor, and we're going to talk about that as well in a couple of minutes. And finally, there are a couple of hormones, namely gastrin and somatostatin, that are secreted by the stomach. We'll talk about the role of those hormones in stomach control in a few slides. If we look at the anatomy of the stomach itself, if we look at the cut section of the stomach that we have in the main portion of this slide, the first thing you'll see is that we have folds inside the stomach. The mucosa of the stomach is thrown into these folds. These are known as rugae. They act kind of like an accordion bellows. So when the stomach is empty, we'll find those folds, those rugae in the stomach. When the stomach starts to fill, they can flatten out and allow the stomach to stretch to hold the material that it does. You'll also notice that there are several different sections of the stomach. Here we have the entrance of the esophagus as we talked about before. The very first section of the stomach that the food enters is known as the cardiac region of the stomach because this is near the heart and you see that outlined here. Now these abbreviations that I have within these boxes are the type of cells that we predominantly find in that area. M stands for mucus and on the bottom the G cells stand for cells that secrete gastrin the D cells are the ones that secrete the hormone somatostatin that we just talked about. Now in the body of the stomach here, which is the main portion of the stomach, you'll notice that we have gastric glands. These are the glands that we're going to talk about in a couple of minutes that secrete mucus. They also secrete something called pepsinogen and they also secrete something called hydrochloric acid. You'll notice this area on the top which is known as the fundus. So we call this the fundic region of the stomach. Now we're going to come to the term fundus several times in anatomy and physiology too. Fundus is the portion of a hollow organ furthest away from the exit. So in terms of the stomach, you'll notice the fundus is here, while the exit to the small intestine in the stomach is down here right by the duodenum. So far we've seen the cardiac region, the fundic region. We talked a little bit about the body, which is the main region here. And then the last portion of the stomach that begins about here and goes this way is known as the pyloric region of the stomach. Okay, and in the pyloric region, we have several different areas that we're going to talk about a little bit more in laboratory. We have a pyloric antrum, which is the first portion of this. We also have this area, which is known as a pyloric canal. And finally, we have the pyloric sphincter. This is a very important sphincter. This is a thickened area of smooth muscle, as you see here. And what this area is designed to do is to keep the food in the stomach a sufficient amount of time until it's liquid enough to pass down into the small intestine and the first segment of the small intestine that we see here is known as the duodenum. Now a couple of other regions that you'll notice, this small curve that we see over here, which we mentioned earlier, this is called the lesser curvature of the stomach. And the one that's over here is called the greater curvature of the stomach, as you see indicated over here. Okay, so let's move on now and talk a little bit more about the stomach. Let's first talk about the blood supply and drainage of the stomach. The main blood supply of the upper abdominal organs, as we'll see a couple of times, is this right here, which is called the celiac trunk or celiac artery. This is a main branch of the abdominal aorta, and you see this splits into several arteries. For example, the left gastric artery, the gastroduodenal artery, which becomes the right gastric artery. What I'm really interested in you remembering here is that the celiac trunk or celiac artery is the main supply for the upper abdominal organs we see in this image, like the liver, the stomach, and the pancreas. Now as far as venous drainage, one of the things we talked about previously in the circulatory system was the hepatic portal vein. And we can see that here. Keep in mind as we go through the digestive system and talk about the different organs, is that basically all venous roads lead to the hepatic portal vein. Okay, so we have veins draining the stomach, the spleen, the pancreas, the intestines. All of these veins eventually go into the hepatic portal vein. These go into the liver, as we mentioned before, they divide up, and they eventually form hepatic veins that will ultimately enter the inferior vena cava and bring blood back to the heart. Okay, so keep in mind that all the veins from the abdominal organs will ultimately drain into the hepatic portal vein first before they go back and enter into the inferior vena cava. Now let's talk a little bit about the gastric glands that we looked at a photomicrograph of before. We can see the origin of these pits in the stomach. Notice this gastric pit that we have right here is basically a space or an opening that leads into these gastric glands. Now within the gastric glands, and you see this blow up on the right side, we have a few different types of cells. 
In the neck area, the upper area, we have mainly mucus cells. These mucus cells are very, very important because they put a layer of mucus here on top of the mucosa of the stomach, and all of this up here is mucus. And what this basically does is coat the lining of the stomach so that the digestive enzymes and the acid, which is up here, doesn't eat away at the lining of the stomach. So these mucus glands are extremely important in protecting the stomach from being digested by its own enzymes, its own gastric juice in other words. Now as we pass from the neck region and go further down, you'll notice several different types of cells which we're going to talk about in a second. We have parietal cells. A little further down we have cells called chief cells. And then down the very bottom you'll see a D cell. This is where we also have the D cells that secrete somatostatin. The G cells, if you remember, secrete gastrin. These are two important hormones that control digestion and we'll talk about their function in a little bit. So you'll notice that throughout these gastric pits in the deep portion of the gastric pits we have all these cells that secrete pepsinogen as well as secrete acid and we're going to talk about which cells secrete what in a couple of minutes. Now let's turn our attention back to the left side of this diagram and you'll notice the different layers that we had in the alimentary canal. We talked about the mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis externa, and the serosa. We see the same four layers here in the stomach. The only addition, as we mentioned before, is that the stomach has a layer of oblique muscle that we typically don't find in other areas of the alimentary canal. However, you'll notice the circular muscle and the longitudinal muscle in the muscularis externa. And once again, you'll notice the myenteric plexus, that is this layer of nerves that are sandwiched between the circular and longitudinal muscle. Remember the myenteric plexus is the one that controls peristalsis and segmentation. Segmentation is very, very important in the stomach. This is that kind of grinding action that we talked about a little while ago. You'll notice the blood vessels in the submucosal area here. So we have blood vessels. We also have some lymphatics. And then, of course, in the lamina propria, as we talked about before, this is the loose areolar connective tissue that's just beneath the mucosal epithelium. And the mucosal epithelium itself is composed of simple columnar type epithelium. And these, of course, are the entrances into the gastric glands or gastric pits. So now, let's turn our attention to the gastric secretions. We want to talk about the different kinds of cells that we have in the gastric pits and about what they do. We mentioned mucus cells before that are found in the cardia of the stomach, and these are basically goblet cells as well as multicellular mucus glands. Very, very important function, as we mentioned, in protecting the stomach wall from digestion with acid and pepsin. Now, we also have hydrochloric acid secreted by the stomach, and we're going to talk about the mechanism of that in a second, but it's the parietal cells that secrete hydrochloric acid. As we'll see, this enzyme is very important in converting this inactive enzyme pepsinogen into pepsin, which is the active protein digesting enzyme within the stomach. Good way to remember that the parietal cells secrete hydrochloric acid is to remember the P in parietal and the P in pH. Another function of the parietal cells is to secrete intrinsic factor. This is important for the absorption of vitamin B12 later on in the ileum of the small intestine. Turns out that if we don't have intrinsic factor, which is a glycoprotein bound to vitamin B12, that vitamin B12 will pass right through the body and never be absorbed. If you think back to the blood lectures, we said that vitamin B12 was important for hematopoiesis. So if the vitamin B12 was to pass through the body and not be absorbed because it wasn't bound to intrinsic factor, that actually gives rise to a type of anemia called pernicious anemia. Now another set of cells we have in the gastric glands are the chief cells as we saw a couple of seconds ago. These cells secrete an inactive enzyme that's known as pepsinogen. And as the name implies, because we're breaking peptide bonds, pepsin is a type of enzyme that breaks down proteins. So the chief cells secrete pepsinogen, and very importantly, that pepsinogen is then broken down by the hydrochloric acid from parietal cells into pepsin. And this is very important in beginning protein digestion. We also have in the bottom portion of the stomach, the terminal portion of the stomach, more mucous glands. We have cells that secrete gastrin and cells that secrete somatostatin. So these cells are called G cells. These cells are called D cells. The mucus is protected to the stomach wall. Gastrin and somatostatin, as I mentioned before, are hormones. Now in infants, primarily, we have an additional substance called renin. I want you to notice the spelling of this. This has two N's in it, R-E-N-N. -N. I -N. This is also sometimes called chymosin, 
And what this basically does is this coagulates milk proteins to make them a little bit more absorbable for the infant. We normally don't have this uh, in adults. The other thing that infants have more of than adults have is gastric lipase. This is an additional enzyme for breaking down fats because of the fats in milk, for example, and the infant's uh, limited ability to digest. Okay, so let's now take a look at the secretion of acid by the parietal cells that we have in the gastric glands. To set this up, you'll notice that the lumen of the gastric gland is over here. In other words, this would be the portion of the gastric gland where the secretions are going to be put and then eventually going to make it onto the mucosa of the stomach. On the other side of the cells that you see here, we have the interstitial fluid. Okay, so this is the fluid that would be nearby to a blood vessel. And then, of course, we have the cells that line the gastric pits. And the ones we're going to be talking about in this diagram are the parietal cells. Remember, the parietal cells produce two important things. One is hydrochloric acid. The other is intrinsic factor that will bind vitamin B12. As you probably know from what we talked about previously in anatomy and physiology, the pH of cells is very important in the function of enzymes. Remember, we mentioned enzymes and how they have an optimal pH for functioning. Most times within cells, this optimum pH is around pH 7. So think about what would happen if these cells produced hydrochloric acid within the cell. That would drastically lower the pH since hydrochloric acid is such a strong acid, and the enzymes may no longer function in the cell. So the cells have this strategy, which is kind of neat. It involves the equation that we looked at earlier and I said was going to become very important throughout the course. This is our second time seeing this equation. If you remember the first time we saw this, it was in conjunction with the respiratory system and the carriage of CO2 in the blood plasma, right? But now what we're looking at is we're looking at this equation as a mechanism to produce hydrogen ion and eventually couple that with chloride ion so that these two things can enter the lumen of the gastric gland and eventually be the hydrochloric acid that's eventually going to activate the pepsinogen into pepsin and also do a couple of other things as well. So let's take a look at the equation. You'll notice that we have gaseous CO2 combining with water in the presence of the enzyme that we've seen before, which was carbonic anhydrase. This catalyzes the conversion of CO2 and water into this. If you remember what that was, this is known as carbonic acid. And then the carbonic acid immediately dissociates into bicarbonate ion, which we see here, as well as hydrogen ion. Now the fate of these two ions is different. Hydrogen ion, as you see, is pumped out into the lumen of the gastric gland, while bicarbonate is pumped back into the interstitial fluid, and eventually that bicarbonate is going to be reabsorbed into the blood. Now one of the things that happens is, as digestion is in full swing, we have so much bicarbonate being produced that the bicarbonate actually alkalinizes or, or makes the plasma more basic. This is known as an alkaline tide. So we see the alkaline tide during heavy digestion. Now one of the things I want you to pay attention to here is notice once again that bicarbonate is a negatively charged ion. And we always want to maintain electrical neutrality in cells. So we want to keep the cells at a net charge of zero. And so you'll notice that we have to trade another negative ion for the bicarbonate ion that we're shipping out of the cell and that negative ion is chloride. This is very useful because the chloride is pumped into the cells and notice once again that the chloride is going to be shipped out of the cells and then is going to combine with the hydrogen ion to form the hydrochloric acid that we need out here to activate the pepsinogen. Now a couple of important functions of the stomach pH. I mentioned these a little bit before. The stomach pH as we said especially of the empty stomach is around 1.5 or 2. It can go up as high as maybe 3 or a little bit above once we have food in it. But this low pH is very important in killing microorganisms, as you see here. It's very important also in denaturing proteins. Let me just explain that a little bit. When we have a protein, remember we have an overall three-dimensional shape of a protein like this. And as we said, you know, we have these little pockets in the protein here, for example, here. And all these little pockets and crevices are places where the protein can interact with other things. Now, if we expose a protein to high concentrations of acid, what happens is the protein denatures. And denaturation is a process that basically causes an unfolding of the three-dimensional conformation. In other words, once this protein is exposed to a high concentration of acid, it no longer is folded properly and will basically unwind like this. Besides inactivating the proteins that we take in, 
The other thing this will do is make this more available for chemical digestion. And remember the main enzyme that's going to attack these type proteins in the stomach is going to be pepsin. So pepsin is going to begin attacking the proteins. It's going to begin chopping it up into component amino acids, dipeptides, tripeptides. And so it's going to make smaller fragments of the proteins within the stomach. So an important first step that's carried out by the hydrogen ion in the hydrochloric acid is denaturation that allows pepsin to do its work. The other thing that the low pH of the stomach does is it begins the breakdown of plant materials and connective tissue that's in meats. Now many of these things of course we said before we can't break down for example cellulose but there are some connective tissues in meat there are some materials in plant that the low pH in the stomach and the acid can begin breakdown. And finally as we mentioned the low pH in the stomach is very important in activating pepsin. In other words converting pepsinogen into pepsin. Pepsin, as we just said, is the active enzyme that's involved in breaking down proteins. Okay, so mainly what the stomach does in terms of digestion is to begin the breakdown of proteins. Obviously, if we have a lot of acid being secreted after we eat something, and that acid could potentially be harmful to the mucosa of the stomach, we don't want a lot of acid produced in between meals. We only want to have the acid mainly produced after we've eaten something. So we have to have a very tight control over acid production and enzyme production within the stomach. So there are three phases of stomach control and as an overview we'll talk about each one of them here. First of all the cephalic phase that we see here, cephalic meaning head, this is triggered by the smell, taste, sight, or thought of food. And as you might imagine this is basically a neural event. In other words this is carried out by nerves. And what this serves to do is to begin the secretion of enzymes and gastric juice and mucus and also begin a little bit of digestion. This is designed really to prepare the stomach for the first bite of food. So this is ramping up digestive activity in preparation for food arrival in the stomach. And this is called the cephalic phase. Now the next phase of stomach control is the main phase. And this phase generally lasts anywhere from two to maybe four hours, depending on the material that we ingest. This is triggered by distension of the stomach, the presence of food in the stomach, and the rise in pH in the stomach as food enters the stomach. We dilute the acid that's already there, and that causes the pH to rise because we're reducing the concentration of hydrogen ion. This is a phase that enhances secretion and digestion in the stomach. And as I said, this is the main phase of digestion. Now these are basically two phases that upregulate digestion and secretion in the stomach. We have one additional phase that serves to downregulate digestion in the stomach and notice the name of this is called the intestinal phase. This does not have to do with intestinal control. We still are talking about control of the stomach. However, the decrease in the digestive activity in the stomach is caused by food entering the intestine and so we refer to this as the intestinal phase. Now this phase is triggered by distension of the small intestine. Once we have a small amount of material come from the stomach through the pyloric sphincter into the small intestine, what happens is we begin the intestinal phase that we're going to talk about in a couple of minutes. And this also causes a pH change in the small intestine because the chyme, the material that's coming from the stomach that goes into the small intestine is acidic. Normally the environment in the small intestine is alkaline or basic and when material from the stomach comes in there that puts acid into a place where normally we have an alkaline pH so there's a pH change. What this basically does is it slows emptying of the stomach. If you think about this logically it makes sense. The stomach is sending a little bit of material into the intestine. The intestine is now saying whoa hold it I got some stuff here I got to take care of don't send me anything else for a little while I'll let you know when it's okay. So what this does is control the rate of gastric emptying by slowing the emptying of the stomach. The pyloric sphincter tightens up a little bit, keeps material in the stomach until the material that was previously sent from the stomach to the small intestine is taken care of and starts moving along. Once again, all of these, the cephalic, the gastric, and the intestinal phases, control activity in the stomach. It's important for you to keep that in mind. And these are the main things that these different phases do. What I want to do next is I want to talk about each individual phase just a little bit more to let you know how this works. Let's begin first by talking about the cephalic phase. 
As we said before, this is enhanced by the sight, smell, taste, thoughts of food, especially when we're hungry. And what this is designed to do, as I mentioned, is to prepare the stomach for the arrival of food. In other words, prepare the stomach for the first bite of food. Let's take a look at what happens. The central nervous system basically is driven by all of these things. So these are conscious things that we think about. Some of them are subconscious. And what happens is via the vagus nerve, which is part of the parasympathetic nervous system, we activate what's called the submucosal plexus. Remember this plexus is at the very bottom of the submucosa. And we said before that this governs the blood flow as well as secretion of glands. When the submucosal plexus gets active, what happens is we activate the mucus cells in the stomach, the chief cells, the parietal cells. Now, one of the things I want you to pay attention to here is notice the direction of these arrows. For example, the arrows that come from the mucus cells, from the chief cells, from the parietal cells. Notice that these are all going into the mucosa of the stomach or into the lumen of the stomach here. On the other hand, I want you to pay attention to this down here. Notice that the G cells are secreting gastrin, but I want you to notice the direction of this arrow. This is going a different way. The gastrin is going to go into the blood, not into the lumen of the stomach. Remember I mentioned before that gastrin is a hormone. Gastrin is the go hormone of digestion. This is put into the blood, goes around the body, and actually comes back to the stomach via the circulation and will upregulate production of mucus, pepsinogen, and hydrochloric acid by these cells. So in the cephalic phase, we have the nervous system stimulating the production of all of these things that we see over here. And ultimately, gastrin is going to come back via the bloodstream and increase activation of all of these. Now, as you might imagine, emotional states can exaggerate or inhibit this phase since this is neurally controlled. Some of us, for example, when we get upset, when we get anxious, we can't eat. You can't even look at food. Some of us, however, can't stop eating when we get anxious or nervous. So this is really dependent upon the individual, but emotional states can greatly exaggerate or inhibit this phase. Now, let's talk about the next phase, which remember I said is the main phase of gastric control. This is called the gastric phase. And what this is really designed to do is to carry out the bulk of the digestion and liquefaction of the material that enters the stomach. So as we said before, this can happen over the course of maybe two to four hours or so, depending on the type of material that we have in the stomach. And this whole stage is started by the cephalic phase that we just looked at. What this is designed to do is to begin to homogenize, that is liquefy, the material in the stomach until it becomes something that's known as chyme. And you see that over here, C-H-Y-M-E, chyme. This is a liquid material, so liquefied material that's in the stomach that eventually will make it through the pyloric sphincter and into the first portion of the small intestine. As this material begins breaking down, what happens, it becomes liquid, and the pressure inside the stomach also begins to increase. When the material is liquefied enough and the gas pressure inside the stomach increases enough, the pyloric sphincter here will pop open, allow a few milliliters of material into the first segment of the small intestine, and then the pyloric sphincter will close again because remember what's going to happen next, as we talked about earlier, is the intestinal phase, which is going to slow gastric emptying. So let's go back and talk about the gastric phase a little bit more. What you'll notice here is that we have a few things that actually enhance gastric secretion during the gastric phase. Notice these things over here. These are very important for you to remember. Number one, when we stretch the stomach by putting food in it, that enhances the gastric phase of digestion. The second thing, as you'll see here, is elevated pH can also enhance the gastric phase. What happens, as I mentioned before, is when we put food in the stomach, the hydrogen ions are diluted, so we reduce the hydrogen ion concentration. That increases pH, and as we'll see in a couple of minutes, once the pH gets up to around 3 or so, it really kicks the stomach into high gear in terms of digestion. And the last thing you'll notice that we have down here is the presence of partially digested peptides. And the secretion of G cells is kicked into high gear by these partially digested peptides. Remember, we subject the proteins to hydrochloric acid. This denatures them and allows the pepsin to start digesting these proteins so that we can have these partially digested peptides that activate the gastrin. This continues, of course, until we have no more stretch. The pH begins to drop and we no longer have that many partly digested peptides. In other words, once this material has largely moved out of the stomach and into the small intestine, there's a negative feedback process that will basically shut off 
all of these things in the stomach. We also have local release of histamine in some of the stomach cells. There are mast cells in the stomach, and as the stomach fills, we can have the release of additional histamine. This is really a control on the secretion of uh, parietal cells in the stomach. Now, you'll notice on the bottom that we have proteins, alcohol, caffeine can markedly increase secretions by stimulating gastric chemoreceptors. You know yourself that if you have a drink before you've eaten, not only do you start getting lightheaded faster, but it also actually begins the increased secretion of all these cells to prepare it for the gastric phase. And histamine, as I mentioned a second ago, produced by some mast cells in the stomach, actually causes an increase in secretion by parietal cells, so it increases gastric secretion. You may have heard of things that are known as H2 blockers. H2 blockers are merely drugs that basically decrease the secretion of histamine, so they decrease acid secretion by parietal cells for those folks that might have ulcers. Now the very last phase of gastric control, remember, is called the intestinal phase. And we call it this once again because now the chyme has entered the small intestine as you see over here. And what happens is there's a negative feedback from the intestine up to the stomach saying, slow down, don't give me any more stuff. So remember that the intestinal phase of gastric control is an inhibitory phase, whereas the other two were stimulatory. Okay, so remember intestinal, inhibitory. This will decrease the rate of chyme entry into the duodenum, which is the first section of the small intestine. This can take hours, really, depending on how full the stomach is and what kind of material we have in the stomach. Turns out that the more fat that we have in the material that we eat, the longer this phase will go on, the longer it will take the stomach to empty. This is one of the reasons why if you have a lot of fat in the food that you eat, you feel full longer. One of the main hormones that we're going to talk about later is CCK. This is called cholecystokinin, and this is one of the main hormones involved in this inhibitory phase of gastric secretion. You'll notice that as acidic chyme enters the small intestine, a couple of things happen. One thing is that the duodenal walls are stretched. In other words, we're starting to stretch the small intestinal wall. This causes secretion of these different things. The other thing is that we start to decrease the pH in the small intestine. Normally it's an alkaline pH, as I mentioned before, and when we bring acidic chyme from the stomach into the small intestine, the pH begins to decrease. This also causes this inhibitory feedback. Now, these things that we see down here are hormones, and these go via the circulation to feedback to these things. But we also have a neural connection. So when, for example, the small intestine is stretched, notice that we have something called the enterogastric reflex that kicks in. This, in turn, inhibits the myenteric plexus, and that will inhibit segmentation, and this will also inhibit peristalsis. So we inhibit the churning actions inside the stomach. We inhibit the movement of chyme into the small intestine. All of these things will basically slow gastric emptying. Now I want you to take a look at the name of this reflex that we just mentioned up here, the enterogastric reflex. Take a look on the bottom of the slide, and you notice that the enterogastric reflex inhibits gastric activity. So it reduces gastric motility, and it also stimulates the contraction of the pyloric sphincter. Now take a look at the name of this. I want you to notice that the first part of this name is entero, the second part is gastric. Entero refers to the intestine. So in this case, we're talking about the small intestine. Gastric refers to the stomach. I want you to notice the order of these terms in the word. This goes enterogastric. In other words, the flow of this word, if you will, goes from the intestine back to the stomach. And if you think about this, this is exactly the opposite of the normal direction of food flow. Remember, we talked about the flow of material that we eat going ab orally, that is away from the mouth. Anytime you see a name like this, which is a reflex, and of course we know that this is a nervous system reflex, and the name tells you that this is going in the opposite direction of the flow of food, it's an inhibitory reflex. If we had a reflex that was named gastroentero, or gastroduodenal, or gastrocolic, as we'll see later on, those reflexes are all stimulatory because the first part of the word is gastric, the second part of the word is intestine, that tells us that we're going forward. Okay, now I know this chart looks a little bit busy to you. Don't get panicky. This basically summarizes all of the things we talked about before. Now you can use this chart to get a big picture if you like. 
if you don't like these big picture type charts like this you don't have to use this just know the individual parts but let me take you through a couple of these first of all notice in the very center we have this we have the two stimulatory phases of gastric control the cephalic and gastric phase and remember a part of each of these is going to be parasympathetic nerve stimulation of the muscle in the stomach the second part of this is going to be the G cells that produce the go hormone of digestion which is gastrin okay so both of these things are actually going to be stimulatory for digestion so that's why I have this at the very center of this now when these kick into high gear in other words when we have high parasympathetic activity when we have lots of secretion of gastrin notice these arrows with the plus sign up here is the key you'll notice that arrows with the plus sign are indicating stimulation so these are all stimulatory so when we have a high degree of parasympathetic stimulation high secretion of gastrin we increase stomach motility that is segmentation of peristalsis we also increase mucus secretion from the gastric glands we increase the secretion of histamine as we said before we also increase secretion from the parietal cells and remember the parietal cells can produce two things they can produce intrinsic factor which is here and also produce hydrochloric acid remember that intrinsic factor is important for binding to vitamin b12 so it can be absorbed later the hydrochloric acid on the other hand is important in activating pepsinogen into pepsin and remember that pepsinogen itself is secreted by chief cells and I want you to notice this arrow over here as well notice that gastrin and parasympathetic nervous system stimulation can increase secretion of pepsinogen by chief cells and because we have increased secretion of hydrochloric acid by parietal cells activated by the very same things we can convert pepsinogen into pepsin now let's take a look at the fate of this pepsin if you'll notice what that does as we said before it's involved in protein breakdown when we break down the protein we produce peptides and if you remember when we talked about the gastric phase of stomach control we said that partially digested peptides activate the secretion of gastrin that's what this arrow right here is showing us the other things that we talked about that activate the gastric phase of stomach control are food in the stomach because we number one stretch the stomach walls that activates increased activity in the stomach the second thing we do is we dilute the hydrogen ion and this causes the pH rise once the pH goes up above three that's a positive feedback signal to increase the secretion of gastrin by the stomach which is the go hormone once again now what happens when the stomach starts to empty remember we said we have to have a very tight control over secretion and acid and those sort of things in the stomach well when the stomach starts to empty one of the things that happens is the hydrogen ion in the stomach is no longer diluted and we have a high production of course of hydrogen ion now by the parietal cells which are in high gear so as they start increasing their production of hydrogen ion as the food starts to leave the stomach what basically happens is the pH inside the stomach starts to go down as the pH goes below about three the D cells in the lower portion of the gastric glands are stimulated to produce a hormone somatostatin and we can think of the somatostatin as being the stop hormone of digestion what this will basically do is turn off secretion of gastrin by G cells so it's going to start turning down digestion remember what phase of the stomach control we talked about that that is right exactly that's intestinal phase that we see right here now some of what happens in the intestinal phase as I mentioned before is the more fats that we have in the food that we take in the longer this intestinal phase the longer time the stomach is going to take to empty so this is really just by way of overview this is a big picture summary of everything that we just talked about prior as far as gastric control and secretion I recommend you look at this I recommend you keep this chart beside you when you look at the individual parts and then try and place each of those individual parts on this chart I think everything will come together as you have this chart and you look at the individual pieces of stomach control I think this will be very very helpful for you I want to talk a little bit about mixing and emptying actions of the stomach next we see the material in the stomach that's being liquefied and digested by the pepsin by the hydrochloric acid and by some of the other watery type secretions in the stomach and you notice first that the pyloric sphincter is tightly controlled and it will remain tightly controlled until the activity in the stomach produces enough pressure so that it can pop open the pyloric valve very briefly 
and allow a little bit of material to go into the duodenum. Once a little bit of material goes into the duodenum, this will activate the intestinal phase of stomach control that we talked about before. Remember, this is a negative kind of feedback on the stomach. Now, the last thing we want to talk about is about gastric absorption. What kind of things can actually be absorbed into the blood through the stomach? Well, not very much, actually. Gastric absorption is very limited due to several things that we see here. First of all, we talked about this important blanket of mucus that covers the lining cells of the stomach, the epithelial cells of the stomach. And this is necessary to prevent the stomach, as we said, from being digested by its own enzymes and by acid. So this will prevent things from actually reaching the stomach mucosa and the blood vessels and being absorbed through the stomach. Another thing is that we have tight junctions between the adjacent epithelial cells in the gastric pits. The epithelial cells themselves lack specialized transport mechanisms to move anything into the blood. The gastric lining is usually relatively impermeable to water. And we have a lot of watery secretions that are being generated here. The intestine, as we'll see, is very good at absorbing this watery type material, but the gastric lining is not. And chyme, as we said before, only contains partially digested material, so this material is still rather large, not small enough yet to really be absorbed to any great extent into the blood. So all of these things basically will limit gastric absorption. However, there are some substances that can be absorbed by the stomach. Some water, although not very much. Some salts can also make it across the stomach lining. Certain lipid-soluble drugs, like, for example, aspirin and ibuprofen, and those NSAIDs can actually cause a problem if we take too many of them. They can actually erode away that mucus lining, that blanket of mucus that covers the cells, and can eventually cause stomach ulcers. The last thing is alcohol. Alcohol can actually be absorbed through the stomach lining. I mentioned before that if we had a glass of, for example, wine before dinner on an empty stomach, it seems to go to your head a lot faster than it would if you had food in the stomach. One of the reasons for that is the alcohol can be directly absorbed through the stomach lining. However, this can be slowed by the presence of fats, in fact, any food in the stomach. Okay, so that finishes off our lecture on the stomach and stomach control. I'll see you next time for part four of lectures nine and 10.